Ladies and gentlemen, Admiral John Greener, the 30th Chief of Naval Operations. Going pretty well so far, huh? <laughs> Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for coming today and good morning. Secretary Mavis, Admiral Ruffhead, thank you very much for your support, uh, getting me here, for your mentorship, and for all that you've taught me through, and most of all, for your trust during these years. I appreciate that very much. I'm honored that the President and the Secretary of Defense would nominate me and the Congress would confirm me as the 30th Chief of Naval Operations. 2011 is a big 3-0 year because this is also our 30th wedding anniversary, so it makes it pretty easy to remember some things I'm here. As Admiral Ruffhead and Secretary Mavis said, it's terrific to see our international military leaders here today. I thank you very much for joining us. Your partnership is so incredibly important, and I look forward to seeing some of you at the International Sea Power Symposium next month. Folks, I understand the traditional role of the incoming officer. You get up, I did that, dress up, so far so good, I showed up, and if I do this right, in short order, I'll shut up. This morning, I had a gee whiz moment. I, I drove through the gate out here, and boy, what a flashback, 40 years ago almost, I passed through the same gate as a midshipman selectee. A skinny kid from western Pennsylvania from a steel town horn rim glasses, Buddy Holly look, hair too long. My sister-in-law says squirrel bait. I don't know what that means yet, but that's what she says that equals. And all I wanted to do was not be in the steel mills. That was my plan. You know, you got to reach certain goals easily. I didn't know what, I knew what I didn't want to do, but I didn't know what I wanted to do. And I thought, well, this Naval Academy thing and this Navy will be a good enabler, and then I'll take off and, uh, well, folks, I haven't figured it all out yet, but here's where you go. Here's where you end up. How about that? Now, how does this happen? How do you get here? I'll tell you, it's not possible without parents who couldn't be with us today, who taught me hard work, humility, honesty, and the, the blue-collar values of those of us that live in the Pittsburgh area. I had great, loving siblings here today checking out, make sure I do this right. Four sisters, anybody has four sisters, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> And a younger brother who was gone all the time, and I couldn't teach him anything. But most importantly, perhaps, and many of you in the military know how this works, you got to marry up. You definitely got to marry up. And in Darlene, I found a loving, giving, patient, underlying, dedicated woman, dedicated to me, to the family, and to the Navy that she loves, and to all those sailors and families that she loves, and who's agreed to take one more job. She has raised amazing children who we dragged all over the world, Jonathan, Brian, and Sarah, who all continue to serve in the Navy or our country in their own ways today, each choosing to serve in their own way. But as we all know, we can't be here. I look across the audience and I see mentors, mentors for 36 years, people who have took, taken the time to nurture me, again, patience, and many who took a chance on this young pup here. From my first department head, Steve Arndt, now that's, that's patience. My first CEO, Gordon McNeil, all the way to Admiral Ruffhead, who brought me along, and Admiral Mullen, who also brought me along in my recent years. But it's also pretty important, when you come from an institution like this, to graduate with the best class ever. The flower children of the class of 75. Well, now that Admiral Ruffhead is not my boss anymore, just another four-star, and haven't been, haven't been accused of being his only vice, I gotta tell you something. I talked to Ellen, and that is not what she said. I was the only vice. Sir, a few words. I wanna thank you again. You've been an amazing boss and mentor with, again, great patience. I thank you for shaping me, for leading our Navy and all that you've done. Uh, it's wonderful that this is, in fact, the Omega for you and Ellen, to where it all began. Ellen, you are really the, the finest First Lady of the Navy and, and the best ambassador that I have seen for our country, uh, leading uh, our spouses and our families. Thank you again so much, and Darlene and I. Thank you very much.
Well, the last two years as the vice chief, I've had a part in uh, crafting, I guess what I'll call, Navy's navigation plan for the future. I take a fix today, I look at it, and I say, we're pretty much on course, and we're not in shoal water. Things are good. Admiral Ruffhead explained it, and I think he's done a magnificent job. My plan is to keep it that way. But I know we've got uncharted waters ahead. I see storm warnings out there, and I see the clouds forming. Folks, we're in for some heavy weather, I think, out ahead. Unfortunately, in a former life, I would say, prepare to die, and we would submerge and avoid it all again. But that's not going to work. Our first step, we've got to rig for heavy weather. And when you do that, and you're out at sea, the first principle is you've got to ensure the safety of the crew. Very important. You've got to establish a reliable gyro that you know will get you where you need to go, that you can steer to, and you've got to stay on course. My priorities, our course, are one, we've got to remain ready to meet the current challenges today. We've got to build a relevant and capable future fleet. And we have got to continue to care for our sailors, their civilians, our civilians, and their families, and recruit and nurture a motivated, a relevant, and a diverse force. Now, we'll approach our challenges and we'll implement our changes that will have to be done in the future with three tenets in mind. Number one, war fighting first. We have got to be able to apply our craft to fight and win if we're called upon. We will build the ability to win tomorrow as well. Two, we have got to operate forward. That is where we're most effective. We provide, as Admiral Ruffhead, the Secretary said, an offshore option. We will have access to the maritime crossroads of the world. And three, we've got to be ready. We've got to be ready for our assigned missions. We will harness the teamwork and the talent and the imagination of this wonderful, diverse force that we have. But we have to be responsible to employ the resources that we're given. And we have a professional and a moral obligation to uphold the covenant that we hold with our sailors, civilians, and our families. Ultimately, we'll give the president offshore options. No permission shift, no permission slip required. They'll be effective, they'll be efficient. Our solutions will be joined, and the Marine Corps will remain our primary partner. Folks, I'm very excited to be the Chief of Naval Operations. If you're going to go into heavy weather and you're on a ship, the best place to be is right on the bridge and steering. I'm confident we'll get through there. We'll stay on course. We'll need to be judicious, deliberate, and vigilant. And it's my honor and pleasure to lead these young men and women of the finest Navy in the world. I look forward to, meet, to taking on the challenges with them and with you. And I thank you very much for coming today.